good afternoon or evening or morning, depending. Uh, everybody, thanks for uh, coming to this uh, new event in uh, Merging Minds. Today we call it uh, Merging Intelligences. Uh, somehow back to the drawing board, back to the generative side of the algorithms. Um, we're going to be exploring how different forms of uh, different paradigms of uh, cognitive sciences that come together to create and to push the algorithms towards creativity, towards fabricating new forms of, of uh, basically intelligence somehow. That's what we call it this title today. Um, and we're going to see three different examples of how we can approach uh, this new potential as, as designers, as creators. So we do have three speakers today. First of all, we, it would be nice if uh, people can turn on their video so we can, at least the speakers can see, uh, definitely during the questions and answers, they can see that there's not a bunch of bots, but actually we do have an audience uh, looking at us. Um, so yeah, first of all, we're gonna have uh, a first speak uh, or a first talk by Manuel Co. Uh, Manuel Co, who is a sort of like well-known uh, or at least definitely has been a, a member of the AA for yeah. quite a while. He's now assistant professor in architecture and sustainable design and design and artificial intelligence in Singapore University of Technology and Design, AGDD. And he's doing artificial architecture, a transdisciplinary research laboratory focusing on the design and development of AI models for predictive urbanism and generative architecture. He's an AA graduate and, and then PhD at EPFL, Switzerland. Uh, uh, his PhD work architectural sampling as a form basis for machine learning, learnable architecture was nominated for the best thesis prize. Uh, he has been teaching or he has taught previously at DAA, Royal College of Art, Tsinghua, Strelka, Angevande, DIA, Harvard, Bartlett, I mean, you name it. No? Uh, and his works has have been uh, has been you know quite uh, extensively exhibited in BNA, um, Design and Computing and Cognition Museum. Uh, sorry, has been published in, in AD uh, in DCC. Uh, has also been practiced uh, or has been practicing in Saha Hadid as well previously. Has collaborated as well with Arup. Um, and as a creative coder at uh, Convergeo in Lausanne and other architects in Berlin. Uh, so then he will be followed by uh, Cristobal uh, Valenzuela. Yeah, uh, I can say a bit about Cristobal over which works I came across a couple of years back and, and I'm super excited to be able to get a bit of his time in. Uh, so Cristobal is a Chilean born technologist and software developer. Um, and the most important thing or how I find out about it that he's a co-founder of Runway ML, uh, and which to me is an attempt of democratizing the use of machine learning um, and as I, as I first interacted with, with Runway ML, it was as a native app for Windows and the Mac version as well. And now there's also a web presence, which I, I hope uh, Cristobal will tell us more about. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, Cristobal, as, I, as everybody knows, basically from online. So, you know, he, he was a researcher at New York University, mainly working on the development of uh, ML5.js which is a, it's a great library, which probably many of us played with already. Um, but yeah, so I'll, uh, we'll talk more about when, uh, when we go to Cristobal's uh, work. And then also, right, Eduardo, uh, I'll let you introduce Yeah, you. we have a uh, third speaker today is Jeffrey Huang. He's the director of the Institute, Institute of Architecture at EPFL, which actually has 25 laboratories and groups in architectural and sciences of the city. He's the founder director of Media Design Lab and full professor in architecture and computer science uh, at uh, EPFL. He's an ETH uh, Zurich graduate, master's and doctor from Harvard. Uh, and he was awarded the General McHugh Medal for Academic Excellence. He has been teaching or his taught in Harvard, Tsinghua, Stanford, um, and he was the head of architecture and sustainable design in Singapore University of Technology and Design. Uh, and well, 
Generally speaking, you'll see how his research examines the convergence of physical and digital architecture, and you'll see that in the lecture he will give us. So I think that without further ado, we should be moving towards first speaker, Emmanuel, then followed by Cristobal, and finally, Jeff. Right. Uh, thanks, Eduardo. Uh, let me share my screen now. Um, okay. Uh, shall I start? Yeah. Right. Uh, thanks, uh, Eduardo, for the introduction. Um, thanks, the AA, for the invitation as well. The title of the presentation is actually, as mentioned by uh, Eduardo, um, title from my PhD thesis, which is architecture assembling a, a formal basis of machine learning architecture. So I would like to begin my presentation uh, by first referring to an uh, excerpt from the online synopsis of today's session, uh, specifically that of an artificial creativity that emerges from the act of concealing and guessing information by algorithms. Uh, but I will in fact replace the words, um, the word concealing with uh, masking and guessing with predicting. To me, this seems to better resonate uh, with the underlying technical operations found in today's uh, generative deep learning models. Masking, for instance, suggests something that is precise and procedural in space. Think of uh, Photoshop's alpha channel uh, masking, for instance. While predicting suggests something uh, that is um, speculative, but calculated in time. Think of Wall Street's uh, stock market, for instance. In fact, notions of uh, creativity and intelligence as facilitated by the spatial and temporal operations of masking and predicting respectively can even be traced back to the imitation game uh, or more commonly known the Turing test. It is an AI test proposed by Alan Turing in his 1950 paper, Computing Machinery and Intelligence. I will in fact share with you a, a series of speculatively architecturalized variation of this Turing test. Um, taken from a, a, a chapter from my new book uh, called Artificial Architecture, Intelligence and Design. In fact, it's chapter two. Um, actually, the, the game serve, for those who are unfamiliar, I just kind of do a quick um, explanation of, of the, the Turing test. Actually, the game serves as the means for Turing, uh, Alan Turing, to answer his own initial question, which is, can machine think? The game is to be played by an AI machine um, called A, a female contestant called B, a, a human interrogator called C, could be either gender. Um, so here masking is in space. Masking in space is to ensure maximum uh, physical absence. In, in this hypothetical setup, C is to predict which between A and B is the AI machine by simply questioning them. A's objective is to find the, is to fool the interrogator, while B is to help the interrogator. So, so three more uh, three hypothetical uh, permutations of this Turing test. Uh, so, um, on the top left diagram, we have the original setup where we have the opaque walls and and no one could see anyone. The top right diagram shows that A can see C, but C could only see its reflection, as shown in the arrow. Uh, the, the bottom left diagram shows that B can see C, and the bottom right, um, sorry, bottom left and bottom right diagram shows that A and B can see and communicate with each other. Each of these architectural configuration um, actually changes the fundamental dynamics of the Turing test, and consequently the definition of intelligence uh, and creativity. In fact, the mas this masking and predicting also happens in a popular um, AI model known as the generative adversary networks or GANs, uh, which I think later many, the other two uh, uh, speakers would probably touch on that also. I call it the uh, adversarial creativity, which learns an approximate and implicit distribution of a given data set. So two competing uh, models, the generator and the discriminator. The generator is effectively masked from ever seeing and sampling directly from the true data set. 
the discriminator is effectively predicting whatever uh, whether whatever that is spit out by the generator is from the real or the fake data set. It's through this process that the generator becomes creative. This same masking and predicting also happens here. Uh, another class of generative AI model known as the deep autoregressive models. I call it the autoregressive creativity, which learns and approximate an explicit distribution of a given data, data set. The true data is being sampled directly. The model's vision is effectively masked from seeing um, and sampling from the pixels in the black regions uh, as indicated in the diagram. By doing so, it is effectively learning how to predict whatever comes after that center pixel in a sequential manner. It is through this process that this model becomes creative. So of course, there are other deep generative uh, models other than the adversarial and the autoregressive. I've picked up two of these because my work mainly falls under either one of them. In fact, most of those examples uh, will be about learning and generating directly in 3D um, and, and are discrete in conception, process, and expression, as you'll see later on. Um, so therefore, a pre preliminary definition of the term sampling in architectural design is needed here before I proceed on. This has a fundamental implication uh, on how one might perceive and encode architectural forms. In fact, it is probably closer to the aesthetics of sampling in electronic music from the late 1970s than the sketch pad of the 1960s. I first proposed the concept of uh, discrete sampling in my 2019 AD article, the issue called uh, Discrete, edited by Jules uh, Ratzin. This is essentially about a different way of seeing one that is more statistical and probabilistic. In short, a new machinic vision, a concept uh, a conceptual threat that began with Le Corbusier's and now extend from James uh, Bridle. However, such an approach actually requires one of the first question or even abolish uh, three key conceptual assumptions within architectural thinking, uh, which is in this case, the, uh, I'll go through more quickly. Firstly, the no figure, no ground. So here you see that a revisit of Stan Allen's field condition of the 1997. 1997 on the left, uh, represent the architect's vision or figure ground. But on the right, uh, probably closer to a convolutional way of thinking, um, the machinic vision, where forms are discrete patterns rather than figure grounds. Secondly, no parts, no whole. Uh, a revisit of uh, Redfeld's Berlin chair of, 1920, of 1923 from the digital period, representing the architect's vision on the top. Um, and the machinic vision at the bottom where forms in this case are resolutional. Thirdly, no shapes, no grammar. A revisit of Stupa Studio histogram of architecture uh, between 1969 and 1971, representing the architect's vision at the top and the machinic vision at the bottom where forms are basically, uh, in this case, mathematical matrices. So the, I'll, ask, I'll start with the uh, adversarial approach now. I will present a project that is an exploration of architecture interiority and ex exteriority using 3D generated adversarial networks. The objective is to produce spatial and formal prompts for creative computational 3D design across scales and domains, uh, such as di direct computational translation from 3D GAN um, generator to, to generate 3D physical artifacts actually suggests significant design potential for um, complex spatial analogy and integrated digital fabrication, which we will see in a bit. So th this first project uh, actually will be exhibited on the, uh, the online NeurIPS creativity gallery sometime end of this month, I think, um, which is the Neural Information Processing System Conference. Uh, it is actually inspired by the Super Studio Histogram of Architecture. Um, so the super studio histogram architecture basically is this, a small catalog of voxel looking like forms called training set, if you like, that have used to, they have used to generate smell about different looking forms across scale. So in fact, I was also very inspired by their seemingly prophetic words. Uh, here's a few quotes. So the problem was to step further and further away from these activities of design adopting perhaps the theory of the least effort, 
emits a generalized reductive process. Later, furniture, environments, architecture, and more were effortlessly generated from the histogram catalog. The histograms were also called the architect's tombs. So the death of the architect, in, in, in other words. Um, the animation next to those quotes uh, on the last three slides are actually generated from a similar training set as that of the histogram. But instead of 30 of them, there are thousands of them. The adversarial creativity somehow emerges as we sample continuously in the latent space of uh, this 3D GAN model, traversing between chairs and buildings and whatever in between. Here's a snapshot of the data set, building, uh, data set of buildings used for the training. They are basically residential blocks. A latent walk interpolating between several possible residential blocks in 3D. So the latent space is actually here, just buildings. Um, on the right, one could actually see the underlying changing probability of each building voxel. For those who have ever trained a GAN model, you probably know of the mode collapse problem. Um, but if we were to conceptually flip that argument as one that is about a notion of strongly and weakly sampled forms, we can see that the weak or the mode collapse version on the right is arguably almost like an archety archetypal form that converges and refuses to diversify. Again, the underlying probability distribution. The darker the voxel, the stronger and more probable it is. In other words, the hallucination of the uh, propensity of, of a voxel. Um, here are some in-progress physical models of those generated abstract voxels. The discrete of colors here represent the uh, bint uh, probabilities. Exceptionally, the white colored voxels here are used to represent any physical human intervention in structurally editing the original GAN generated 3D forms. In a way, it is an attempt to break from the current <clears throat> industry obsession in CAD CAM um, generative design where structural optimization, material minimization have become seemingly the sole pseudo legitimate drivers of form finding. Now let's quickly look at a few recent projects uh, showing 2D latent works uh, might be easier to understand. In this case, the project looks at generating unseen uh, anime-inspired architecture. For those who are a fan of uh, Japanese anime, probably would know that this is closer to the style of um, Hayao Miyazaki of Japanese Studio Ghibli. So I call it fictional, fictional architecture. Uh, just for a bit uh, for the chief to finish. and some generated samples which uh, are completely synthesized. And then this other project called the addition alteration architecture. Um, so the idea with a concurrent later works of the before on the left and the after on the right uh, in terms of architecture renovation or conservation, where we see this, um, sometimes you see the change of the roof, the addition of the attic, it's actually inspired by the OD5 thing or the DOD5, but I was very really curious how it worked out in architecture. It probably should look like ruins or something, I don't know. But anyway, so um, showing instances of plausible architecture operation to house extension, uh, roof replacement and uh, attic additions. This really old project from 2017 is included here, mainly to show that a segmentation model is inherently generative. It's an alternative to Google Map in that it doesn't just show the shortest route from uh, point A to point B. It also shows the safest routes to take where red colors represent unsafe routes where and blue and green represent safe routes. The overlay are essentially the pixel semantic segmentation by the deep learning model. In this case, uh, a vanilla unit. 
Now, the second form of artificial creativity uh, that I would like to share is the autoregressive creativity. This is something that I've been working during my PhD. Um, it is also the nature of, of autoregressive model that training the, that the training and the generated data is of the discrete form. Agizum's non-stop CD has always been inspirational to me. In particular, the discrete aesthetics and the sequential process found in their typewriter-based work. Of course, there is no machine learning implementation by Archizoom, but the discrete and sequential nature suggests computational appropriation for an autoregressive approach, like this project that was published in 2018 that samples existing Pokemon game levels to generate new ones. On a more architecture and three-dimensional note, here's the 3D model of the famous Barcelona Pavilion by Miss Venderon. Uh, the roof has been removed in this case to better illustrate the internal spatial configuration. In a similar autoregressive manner, we have just created a, a no-stop city of Barcelona Pavilion's variants. Well, the pavilion, the pavilion is first discretized and then quantized. In signal processing speak, this is basically the meaning of sampling. This is also chosen to better illustrate the fulfillment of that three notions I mentioned earlier. The notion of no figure, no ground, no parts, no whole, and no shapes, no grammar. An isonometric uh, view of the same input. Apart from the original one by one meter grid uh, in the, or the, the of the pavilion, um, we could actually understand it from a more resolutional perspective. This is at 2.2 2 by 2 meters. This is by uh, 0.5 by 0.5 meters. So if you look at them, this is the scale comparison of the four different resolution and, and they have a direct impact on the ways in which we um, do the sampling. A generated instance here based on just uniform probability distribution. So basically every cell state has the same probability of being generated, which equates to nonsense. And another generated instance uh, solely on the true frequency counts of each cell state in the training set, but without something, the spatial relation among them. So again, close to nonsense. A generated instance biased towards the horizontal, meaning the horizontal navel of the discrete cells. Uh, another instance towards the vertical. Another one with a weighted sum between the vertical and the horizontal. So we are getting closer to the original um, pavilion. And more, uh, probably this one is closer. We could actually see parts of the original uh, pavilion in, in the middle. Here's the visualization of the vertical horizontal bias triggered during the generative process. We can see that it tends to be contiguous in, in space. Uh, the surrounding designs are automatically inferred from it autoregressively. Each design exhibits different degrees of intended as well as unintended form and spatial novelties. This other project looks at another architecture classic, the Maison Domino, but with a twist. Here, two different inputs designed as abstracted voxel models. The first one, a Maison Domino A, which is the original Cabuzier's Maison Domino, with the pilotus, the free facade, the defining features of modern architecture. And then we have the uh, Maison Domino B, which is basically an inversion of the uh, Maison Domino with sheer walls and non-free facade, of course. At a lower resolution, uh, there are actually about 500 unique voxel patterns. Uh, this is the complete set of patterns um, shown alongside, if you could see it's pretty small, the, the frequency number found in the Maison Domino A. And in this case, at a much higher resolution with about 3,500 unique voxel patterns. This is also representative as a complete set of patterns found in Maison Domino A. An illustration of the autoregressive convolutional process after discretization and quantization, where we could see the uh, probability of uh, specific patterns. With that, one could begin to perform arithmetics in probabilistic space. For example, an addition between a meson domino A and B, or a subtraction between meson domino A and the side cases. Some more examples of the uh, new meson domino A and B. 
we, we could actually see the shear one, the pilotis uh, still being clearly retained in the generator outputs. Uh, this last project is on the sampling from the original building complex designed by Ricardo Bofill, but as semantic voxels, meaning um, we have two different, uh, well, in this case, we also have two different 3D inputs, the A and B, uh, but it is directly taken from the building complex. One is a zigzag staircase configuration, the other one, a enclosed uh, spiral staircase conf configuration. Such a remix mode of spatial design uh, based on probability distribution alone can actually operate at a highly specific level of details. In this case, uh, a simple illustration of these two very different building staircases generating uh, novel variations and familiarity as well. A funded government research project that I'm currently leading as the principal investigator is included here mainly to show that, again, segmentation model is could be inherently generative. But in this case, unlike the 2017 predictive satellite project that I showed just now, this one is um, discrete and in 3D. So in fact, the notion of classification can be reframed as a generative one, as I tried to show in this diagram, and vice versa. Lastly, a last, this is the last slide, showing the work from the, since I'm speaking at the AA, the work from the AA Shanghai Visiting School um, between 2016 and 18, when I was teaching as a unit master. In that sense, it has actually provided me with one of the earliest platforms to embark on my deep learning journey. Starting with something as simple as 2D star transfer back in 2016. Thanks. Thank you, Manuel. I'll, uh, I'll invite Cristobal to, to take us over then. Uh, sure. Um, should I share my screen? Yeah, I think you should have the right to, to share the screen. Perfect. Give me one second. Awesome. Can you share my screen now? Works? Yeah, all good. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me here. Um, super happy to to share some of uh, the things we're working at Runway um, and to talk to you a bit more about about why we're building it. Um, I guess I have uh, just to confirm, Olivia, I have like twenty minutes or so, right? Yeah, we can have yeah twenty thirty minutes. It's a it's a good time for me. Yeah. Perfect. So I thought of like just walking you all through kind of like some of the principles behind Runway and then spend some time on like uh, a demo. I think a lot of the ideas and things we'll discuss in the presentation will be much clearer uh, with a live demo that will showcase some of the principles and ideas and and um, kind of the concept behind behind the presentation. So hopefully, hopefully that works. Um, so yeah, first of all, thank you all for inviting me and for um, uh, being part of this panel. Um, my name is Cristobal. Um, I'm uh, one of the co-founders of Runway. Um, and today I'm going to walk you through why we're building a platform. If you haven't used it before, um, Runway is what we like to call like a next generation uh, creative toolkit. Um, and it's a web-based platform or a desktop-based platform that you can run in your computer and allows you to play with state-of-the-art deep learning models. Um, and, and so the idea of why we decided to, to build this, and this is something we've been working on for the last three years or so with a small team of uh, researchers and developers in New York. Uh, the project started out as a research uh, proposal inside uh, the University of New York, and then it evolved as a, as a company over the last two years. Um, but it has it's basically rooted in this idea that, that creative tools have have based much of the grammars on which uh, they're currently built on, on iterations of the same old principles. And so these principles came from early computing stages in the 80s and 90s um, and have remained probably uh, unchanged over the last uh, 10, 10 or 20 years. Um, and these principles have worked. They've allowed us to develop um, um, designs, films, um, uh, and, 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 and uh, on compositions in general. Um, but what we see as a problem is that they are rooted in uh, outdated ways of creating, uh, of uh, working with computers or creating media in general. Um, and they're rooted in those old kind of like 
uh, principles because traditional computing paradigms have basically been based on taking the analogies from the real world and transferring them into the physical, into the digital world. So in Photoshop, you have a pencil, which is a representation of a physical pencil that you have in the real world. You have a canvas, which is a representation of a real canvas that you have in the real world. Um, you have rulers and you have erasers and you have, uh, or in film editing, for instance, you have uh, like cutting video or the same way you did in like the physical film strips um, before digital editing was possible. And so we've evolved and we transform with those principles over time, but we haven't realized that computing power, computing primitives have evolved and changed at a different pace, much faster and uh, in a different direction. Um, and that's, that poses interesting uh, things. The first one is that um, those new computing principles are way faster and way more efficient than the analog ones we've been working with. Um, and so when you think about material learning specifically or deep learning techniques, which have kind of like conquered the space of uh, image base and design and creativity over the last few years, you start seeing something kind of like different from the traditional approach to computer graphics that um, has dominated the, the, the research ecosystem uh, before deep learning kind of like techniques um, came into the scene, which is you, the, the power and the access to data sets and the power and the access to new GPU uh, and computing devices have basically allow for an exponential growth of generative techniques for image, video, and design compositions. Um, and the way these models work, the way these algorithms perform, it's kind of like works differently from what you could see in any traditional design software. It's, if it's Rhino, if it's Grasshopper, the software could be Houdini, Maya, Premiere, Photoshop, those softwares have different grammars, principles, and primitives than the deep learning techniques that or deep learning methods that you can start using with uh, with neural networks. And so it, it it poses an interesting question of like what would be the interfaces of this of the future? And this is what we're kind of like currently working at Runway, asking ourselves, how do you interact with these models? How do you work across latent spaces, for instance? I'm going to explain what a latent space is in a, in a bit. Um, how do you work collaboratively with these devices, with these algorithms that are able to generate, synthesize, and create, let's say, photorealistic images? Uh, they can help you assist in a design of a piece you're working for, 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 for a building. Um, do we still use the same pencils and drawings and grammars and erasers and rulers that we used before? Or do we need to adjust ourselves to a new set of like uh, uh, concepts on how to work with this with these algorithms? Um, and I know there are a lot of architects here, mostly. Um, and it's important to notice that this, this um, um, kind of like revolution in the way we think about uh, content design and creativity is not only rooted into the images, but it's across the spectrum. You go from sound to text to video to 3D, right? Um, and so you have ways of creating content or modeling objects in 3D. It was previously very hard, it was almost impossible to think of before. Um, and here we're going from image to image, so going from a 2D image to a 3D model for, or, or, or uh, OBJ. Uh, but you can also start thinking about uh, going from text to 3D objects. Let's say you want to describe a building, you want to describe a bird, you want to describe a table, and you get an algorithm that basically synthesizes not just the image of that building or that chair of that bird, but also the 3D model of it. And it's accurate enough that you can export it and use it like in, in traditional 3D kind of like environments. Um, and so this, this for us is really interesting because it poses a lot of different challenges on how to use it and how to interact with this to make them, first of all, responsive, second and second, um, expressive enough. Uh, because one thing that a lot of kind of like, I think um, discourses like misinterpret is that we tend to think that ML technologies or deep learning technologies or AI in general we kind of replace traditional workflows. Um, we in Run, we see it in a different manner. We see it as augmenting kind of like existing workflows, making them easier, faster, and for the creators, for the architects, for the designers, way more expressive at the end. Um, so that, that's basically what Run, we tries to accomplish. We're trying to harness that creative power of deep learning models, of machine learning in general, making it, first of all, very accessible for people to use cutting edge deep learning models um, without any requirements or previous experience in, um, uh, in Python, in TensorFlow, in Cafe, or in GPU management, right? 
Um, and the second one is building those interfaces or what we call those primitives and grammars that will allow you to uh, play with um, and build and create with, uh, with these models in real time. Um, the way we, we approach the problem is that we take a lot of the primitives that you can see in the data science world. And so data annotation, labeling, training, inference, which are like early languages and things you'll find in like um, most data science tools today, we've taken them and abstract them in a way that um, anyone with uh, formal or with experience working in like any other creative software, Photoshop, Houdini, Maya, Rhino, can basically to take and understand how to work with those data science primitives inside a creative environment. Um, and I guess I guess the, the question and the emphasis that we want to like keep repeating to, to our users and from a research perspective that we're trying to solve is that we're trying to understand, as I was saying before, that the tools that we use in our um, tool setting our creative toolkits uh, in, a, in, in our daily life um, are just a representation, right? A pencil in Photoshop shouldn't actually behave as a pencil, it's just a metaphor, right? And so one of the things we're trying to think about is like, what are those metaphors for the future, right? If the pencil has worked for the last 10 years, what will be the pencil of the like next 20 years, right? Um, one thing I guess that, that that is important to notice, and this is specifically with regards to how um, just the technology around deep learning works is that it's a bit different from traditional computer graphics uh, approaches for image, video, and like rendering in general. Is that neural networks have tend to have billions, millions of parameters to to process, and so um, this takes first of all a lot of time, um, and it's computing really computing intense. And so being able to work uh, on a real time manner interactively on your device becomes uh, um, a real challenge if you don't have really powerful uh, devices to compute the, the billion of parameters for every single neural network. And so one of the challenges here is like how to not just like compose those grammars or interfaces, but make the system fast enough, responsive enough for you to train models. I'm gonna go into what training actually means and how it works, um, but also running inference. So um, it, like any creative software wouldn't actually be helpful if it took 10 uh, minutes or 20 minutes to process a single variation, right? And so that needs to work uh, when you're working with uh, neural networks really, really well. And so we also build and kind of like try to solve that challenge with, with a cluster that we built on the cloud. Um, so I hope that that kind of like gave you all like very uh, um, um, kind of like general overview of like the reason behind Runway and where we're building the tool. Um, and I thought for the next 10 minutes or so that I have, I can walk you through uh, a quick demo of like some of the core com core features of the platform. Um, and I can show you some of the things other people have built so you can get an idea of how the tool works. Um, and then if there's time, I can also answer some questions. Um, you can still see my screen, right? Yep. Okay. Um, so Runway, as as um, Olivier mentioned, runs on the on the web, so um, you can access it from any browser. You can also download it and run it as a desktop application. Um, I'll show you the web version, but they're both basically identical. Um, so the first things that that you'll notice is that Runway is built around this idea of a, a model soup, right, or, or a model directory. And a model directory is a collection of different algorithms for uh, different purposes, right? We try to categorize them into a specific kind of like uh, spaces, but to be honest, it's very hard to classify a model, for instance, that does text to image generation. Like that kind of like touches on two things, right? You have primitives from text and primitives from image. So it's kind of like both. And, but still, like this is a good way of like searching if you're kind of like new to a platform for possible algorithmic kind of like um, um, models. Um, and so Runway basically allows you to search for research. These are some of this are basically um, research that has recently been published on um, models that uh, exist on the open source community for a while, like YOLO, which is a per very popular like object classification and detection uh, algorithm. Um, some things are more experimental, some things are way more robust. But here the idea is for you to explore uh, these algorithms. And we see this as um, kind of like the filters, right? You, you get a filter, you get an option, you get a primitive of an, a tool that performs something in a specific manner. And the, the interesting thing that you need to notice about all these algorithms is that 
they're really good at doing something in particular, uh, but they're really bad at generalizing to other uh, domains. So a model that does person segmentation, a model that generates images, a model that does texture optimization can only do that one specific thing. And so the challenge is how do you can compose them in ways that you can generate, compose, and work um, iteratively with, with models uh, together, one, one next to the other, right? Um, and so let's say let's say one I want to work with a model that uh, it's able to generate or synthesize uh, buildings, right? So this is a model someone um, uploaded to a platform. It's trained on a specific data set of uh, Gridalis architecture. Um, I can learn about how this algorithm was made. Um, I can learn the um, kind of like technical characteristics if I want to run it CPU based or GPU based. And I can I can explain what this actually means in a bit. Um, I can check the code. I want to. I can go into the PyTorch repository and like modify things if necessary, um, or I can add it to a workspace. Uh, and so, a workspace is literally a collection of models. So you can see here, I have um, a few different models for different um, set of characteristics. I can run this model. So the the first the thing that I'm doing here when I'm running a model is, um, I was telling before, um, computing power becomes really relevant here. Um, and so when you run a model, you're basically um, connecting your um, your device to V100 uh, or a K80, which are GPU devices that allow you to run and process multiple um, or millions of parameters of this neural network in real time. Um, and, and so when I was telling you all about this idea of primitives or grammars, these for us are the, the beginnings of those, right? Um, this is what we call a latent space um, explorer. Um, so what you see here, these are not real images, right? Uh, they look like photos of facades of buildings. Um, what you see actually here is um, the, ourselves moving into the latent space of an algorithm. And something that's really interesting to, to have in mind is that, is that we as humans only think in three dimensions, right? X, Y, and Z. Um, this model in particular, has 512 dimensions. So it has 512 dimensions that we can just like, it's impossible to visualize or even to put it in a software that's like uh, impossible. So one, first of all, one key challenge is how do we take those dimensions and reduce them um, in an explorable, easy to use interface that you as a creator can use to find interesting uh, vectors or, or patterns. And so what you see here is a dimensionality reduction technique We've taken 512 dimensions and we've reduced them to, to two, right? Um, and the image that you see in the center, uh, we're using a genetic algorithm to basically uh, modify the neighbor images. Um, and so the image in the center determines the images on the right, and then the image on the this image determines the neighbors. And, and you get an interesting combination of, uh, of, of variations. Um, you, get, you have a few parameters that you can change. Um, to basically um, define how much or how less uh, of a variation you want in your images. Um, and in general, this is the kind of expressiveness where we're trying to search for runway. This for us is like really, really, really the beginnings of it. Um, a few challenges lie ahead, which is basically modifying and uh, uh, optimization, uh, optimizing the image or working with the image on top of it. So being able to define specific regions, edit it, um, and have the model kind of like regenerate specific parts of it. Um, if you train a model on 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 um, on a specific data set, and this is also interesting or important to consider, um, that the data set that you use really determines the outcome. And so, uh, one thing that we've seen a lot is that, uh, or I think I believe in terms of like how the work of architects, designers, um, and creators will evolve in the future is that we'll eventually become more and more of a curator, right? An editor of sorts, someone who navigates large amounts of data sets, vast amounts of data, and basically has the work of understanding which parts are you going to take to train a model. And so your work as a creative is actually to be very sensible to uh, data sets, to be able to combine images and we all kind of like work in a in with that like editor uh, editorial or like curatorial um, um, kind of like mindset. Um, but the images that you use and the data set that you use really determine how well uh, of a result you're gonna get, right? Um, and so um, this, for instance, is a is a good representation. Um, this is a model that was trained just on faces. Um, and so the faces that you saw seen here, these are not real people. 
but they try to con convey the idea that like a good data set paired with a good model with enough training will generate photorealistic enough results uh, that you can use in, in production. Um, and so the idea of runway is like not just to be able for you to explore this, understand how they work, which is one of the things that we've kind of like been working on uh, with all of universities, kind of like understanding the platform as a tool for education, first of all. Um, and we have a few people who have built a lot of open source plugins and extensions around Runway. Um, so I know there are a few architects here. If you have ever played with Rhino or Grasshopper, uh, there's an integration that allows you to connect all the render capacities of Runway inside Grasshopper. So you can do a parametric kind of like modeling uh, approach to the platform as well. Um, that's done via a, a, a series of like live connection protocols that allow you to run Runway and connect Runway to any any software that can uh, use Socket IO, SC, or HTTP protocols to, to stream data between between the two. So I'll leave that there in, in case anyone wants to wants to explore those. Um, and and the other thing I guess um, I, I want to mention, and um, I'm, I think I'm running out of time, um, is not just the idea of running in Ferenc. So first of all, I invite you all to check a few of the models that we have in the platform. We have around, there are around 400 different models in it. Um, there's also um, an SDK. Um, so if there's any PyTorch, TensorFlow developer uh, watching the stream who has some experience working with deep learning models, you can actually take any deep learning model with a basic uh, set of uh, um, uh, additions to your code and add it to the platform. So this, for instance, visualizing inception or ResNet layers was added by a user uh, yesterday. Um, if you don't, uh, you can basically train uh, models from scratch. You can retrain a YOLO-based model for custom object detection. This is actually very helpful if you want to compose a data set. If you want to work as a curator, you can train a model on detecting specific features in videos and images, and Runway will then create a data set that you can use in, let's say, an image-based generator. Um, and so exporting those images into Runway uh, becomes really easy. Um, I leave it. I'll leave it there. Um, I can show you a few other things if uh, I guess there's uh, a time for a Q&A later. Um, but I'll leave time for the other the next presenter. Um, thank you. Thank you, Cristobal. Thanks. Yeah. So we'll yeah we'll leave a we we'll leave time at the end for a Q&A and go through everything. Would be nice to kind of like bring everything together in a way. Uh, so I'll uh, I'll pass it on to Jeffrey. Yeah, the last speaker. Thanks a lot. Okay, good afternoon. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, yes, we can. Yes. Okay, great. So thank you, Eduardo, for the kind invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, in answer to the question of merging intelligences, I would like just to focus on one, um, one project, uh, which is on uh, artificial Swissness, and look at, essentially, it's about taking GAN seriously from an architectural point of view. So how the latent space of GAN can lead to serious Swiss architecture. And of course, this is an tautology because Swiss architecture is already serious. Um, so what I would like to do is um, walk you through this project um, that has eight phases. Um, and some of the underlying questions were whether Creativity in architecture was only exclusive for humans. Can machines automatically learn and generate meaningful architecture? So architecture that is actually real, especially in the Swiss context, can they go beyond quantifiable data and optimization and enter the realm of architectural quality? So it's really the nuances of what it produces that interest us. Can machines capture and generate something as fragile and elusive as Swissness in architecture? And what are the dangers and dark sides when we let the machines lose? Um, we had uh, three uh, uh, inspirations that uh, started this project. One was the fascination for African uh, electronic music. I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, Mamo Sani, for example. So he's an artist. This is his uh, actually LP liner that says how he does music. It essentially, it's to interpret a rich and varied history of Niger's dance songs and uh, electrifying nomadic drum of the Tende, the polyphonic ballads of the Vudabi, and the pastoral hymns of the Saheli herders. So it's a very bottom-up approach that samples um, 
sounds and traditions from the region. A second uh, inspiration are some of the books in architecture that um, essentially uh, point to the importance of images uh, and the visual cortex of the designer so that um, essentially the incredible human uh, associative uh, capacity, visual capacity that has been um, actually uh, pointed out by Antonio Damasio. So it's, it's a visual intelligence rather than an, an analytical or a spatial or another one. And the third source of um, inspiration is this image here that actually Emmanuel uh, 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 pointed uh, me to initially. Um, this, this painting that um, has been generated by uh, guns and sold for 400,000 dollars at Christie's, but it's not so much the, um, the, this painting itself that was interesting, but the story around it, the discussion about authorship, about um, who's actually the creator of this art piece and this whole uh, controversy surrounding uh, this young uh, Robbie Barrett, the decoder who actually did the original code and uh, subsequently, of course, um, didn't get a cent from the 400,000, but uh, managed to build for himself a successful career by exploiting um, this new aesthetics that um, was already hinted at in the painting with the, this new aesthetics of glitches and errors and so forth. So, um, Based on those uh, three ideas, we set up a uh, research project that included also a studio to, um, uh, to, to explore um, the capacity of uh, GAN. I think Emmanuel already showed uh, an, a diagram of how GANs work. Just briefly, without going into the details, it's of course uh, a uh, adversarial network that consists of a um, generator and an uh, discriminator acting in a controversial loop and and, um, and uh, producing uh, new architecture, uh, new images, of course, through through that interaction. Um, the phases um, that uh, we go through, and this is very important in terms of authorship, is the sources of data. How do you source the data? Where does it come from? How do you scrap it? How do you um, filter it? And in the context of uh, Swissness, uh, these were um, we focused on uh, mountain huts that could then be easily cleaned. And so we had a sample set of about 6,000 um, images to work from. Um, in terms of the, the, the GAN, as you know, uh, the GANs are not all the same. Um, the nuances of uh, GANs, um, um, the tool we used was a deep convolutional gun, which is a DC gun that you see to the uh, top, and um, SA gun, self-aware gun that you see at the bottom. Right? So the DC gun is a deep convolutional gun that has been imported from other areas that so, so from uh, convolutional neural networks that have uh, been used in successful applications for object detections and image recognition. And as Egan uh, inserts into between the layers of uh, convolutional layers, um, an attention map, maybe akin to the human's attention, in order to um, uh, provide uh, more uh, structural uh, coherence in the image so that the, you get more correct structures, especially, uh, let's say, in the buildings, uh, there would be. Uh, faster um, um, uh, or, or a more correct representation of, uh, let's say, windows or elements of architecture. Um, so the sampling, the Latin space is really the, the, um, the, the source of the, or, or also the goal of the project, maybe to show um, how a typical Latin space looks like of an, um, in this case, a DC gun that has been trained uh, using about 6,000 images.
So a specific moment uh, is then chosen and frozen and uh, turned into architectures. These are a couple of other ones. Uh, one that this one uses uh, self-aware guns. And this, another one using a DC gun again. So the process is that the humans observe the what's happening uh, in the Latin space, and then using their their their, their cognitive capabilities to um, recognize. Um, Swissness, and then, uh, of course, freeze to, to freeze that, to export that, to extract it, to analyze it, and then to automatically transform into um, a uh, 3D form from from the from the image. So these are some uh, sample iterations from the instances of the Latin space. And now, uh, in order for this to become serious architecture, of course, those uh, volumetric models, the scan volumetric models, had to be confronted um, against a real site, uh, in this case, a, a mountain site, a real program, um, the program of a refuge, in this case, a typical cabin program. Uh, it has to be confronted against uh, materiality uh, or and the tectonics, so, so construction. This is a typical one to 20 drawings that um, is prevalent in Switzerland. And uh, then we tested that also with uh, students. This is a student project uh, that by Clara de la Puerta, where she essentially, that's the project that she derived from such a workflow. Uh, what is interesting is that uh, there's on one hand typical, very typical Swiss elements that you could see that are almost one to one um, taken from the images that you may be aware of in, in, in the Swiss mountain, but then there are irregularities. So the windows are not all the same, they're actually a gradual shift. There are glitches, of course, in the uh, in the in, in the facade, um, and um, maybe you see that in a three D print. Unfortunately, this this picture is not not very good. So this is just one uh, special case. What can you generalize? So this is an early project, and of course, we are only beginning to to understand um, what actually this means to work so closely together with the machines. Um, but uh, even though there are early examples, they are already indicative of um, what could come out. So if we go back to the question of how, how this merging of intelligence um, happen, uh, and the question of what happens to design creativity when human and machine intelligences merge, um, one, uh, of course, the, the sampling plays a key issue. Um, so if you compare that not to other ways of sampling, but a, a typical architectural workflow where you would imp where you would actually design from maybe a dozen of one to 10 um, precedents, this is a, 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 a order of magnitude um, higher degree of, uh, of um, sampling, or it's a bottom up sampling of um, uh, precedence. Um, what uh, turns out to be very important is that even if you use uh, the same uh, techniques so the general adversarial generative adversarial networks, even variations of that is not innocent. So that 
if you if you if you look at the this is a comparison of DC gun and SA gun um, SA gun with these attention layers that would um, create something much more um, structurally correct, whereas uh, DC gun. So it's uh, it's really to play with this tension of uh, reproduction fidelity, so create more perfect copies and uh, machinal uh, estrangements, or how to uh, introduce, embrace even um, imperfections. And uh, this uh, this is a, a, an observation that we made uh, towards the end that. What is valuable, and this may be referring to uh, the previous speakers uh, uh, pointing us to that this uh, is not a two or three dimensional, but a 500 or 600 or n dimensional space, um, that the, the, the Latin space, uh, once you freeze it, you actually lose much of its uh, richness. Um, so this uh, temporal sampling across time, across two moments in time, is really what um, what leads actually to much better architecture. And then the final point, um, uh, what was interesting in this case is that the relationship, the creative uh, partnership has been inversed. So it is the machines that gives a spark uh, of creativity, and then the humans who uh, rationalize um, the design using their uh, the cognitive uh, visual capacity, of course, but also their architectural common sense. And so with this, uh, thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Cristobal and Emmanuel for the for the interesting talks and definitely thanks a lot. We have some time for questions and answers uh, since you've uh, we've been actually quite punctual in that sense. And we'll open it now to the audience to ask questions uh, to see if anybody wants to raise their hand and then. Ask anything. Uh, is there anybody that has or wants to start? Oh, we already had a round of questions in the in the chat, though, and answer as well. <laughs> yeah, there's something in parallel. <laughs> That's good. So if, if nobody else wants to start, I will start. I think it's a question to, to all three of you is um, to, or in which field or in which sort of like line of expertise or, or, or particular aspect of our of architectural uh, design discipline, do you think AI is actually changing us or changing the profession more? Is it is it on the agency and who designs what? Is 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 there a, st a stylistic impact nowadays? Or not so much, and the, the 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 impact is more on the on the processes and the simply the speed at which we do our profession. Or what is it really that you think uh, architecture is changing now due to the emergence of, of these techniques? Are we seeing new styles, new approaches or perhaps we see new agents suddenly designing that couldn't design before. Uh, what is it the, that these new intelligences are sort of like changing most in our profession? So I, any of the speakers can actually start. I think Cristobal talked about architects being more curators than anything else, or the fact that suddenly more people can actually access design is it the case. Uh, Jeffrey mentioned about uh, basically humans trying to rationalize what otherwise the gun is fabricating for us. Um, is it really changing our profession?
Um, I can uh, I can answer, I guess, that from not from an architect's perspective. I'm not a trained architect, so <laughs> I wouldn't say it's training my profession. I guess I've worked with some architects before, so I guess I can give my 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 just my impression with from the outside world um, uh, and how I see some of the things we're, we're working on, how the field is evolving, my effect, not just architects, but I guess designers in, in general. Uh, and I think I mentioned this, or I went over it in the presentation that you were like referring to it again. I think it's, it's this idea that um, the if you have algorithms and systems that can design as efficiently and as well as humans can do, then the role of uh, humans or the role of the architect or the designer in general will be more of a curator of sorts, right? I, I emphasize that as a presentation, but being able to understand how Futures and patterns are um, defined in specific data sets that you use. And in some sort, I've analyzed and researched how a lot of creative professional work. And there's definitely this data set collection aspect uh, that most people do without realizing they're doing like a data set collection. So designers do this like a mood board before they start any kind of like creative project. And that, from a data science perspective, is just like, yeah, you're creating data. Um, and architects probably do the same. Again, I'm not a trained architect, but I'm sure like a lot of people here when they're trying to approach a project, they start first looking at references, studying other architects, studying lines, approaches, techniques, and that's just data set, right? You're like, you're, you're trained to recognize the data. Um, and so what becomes interesting is that now you're able to feed the data to a system that understands patterns and and futures in a way that you do, but also in a way that like actually you don't think of. And so you have a system that thinks of the, looks at the data this, at the same data that you're collected, but can suggest an approach and builds things in a different manner. And so that becomes really interesting, what that role will, uh, how that role will evolve. I think something we'll need to figure out and like solve together. Um, I don't have a clear answer of like what the role actual um, dynamics of interacting with this algorithms will be in like 10 years or so. Uh, I'm just intrigued to see how the profession itself would change from being the people and the designers who do all the minor labor, everything at every single stage, to be more of like these managers of sorts, these directors of sorts, the one who's managing the orchestra rather than like the musicians themselves. Uh, I guess that's that's how I say it. But again, from not from an architect, so I can't speak to that, uh, but hopefully that was helpful. Well, if I may add, so, so from our point of view, the biggest interest in what we're doing with GANS has been actually in uh, uh, what we call uh, cultural resilience, um, essentially. Um, so from, from places where typically you would, like uh, Cristobal said, st usually study architecture and then import uh, styles from somewhere else, whereas um, with uh, with an approach and with a more sample, local st sampling, uh, and especially in all those um, current trends towards uh, decolonialization and uh, cancel culture and so forth, that you you could um, resist essentially this um, importation of um, other styles and, and, and uh, reinforce um, essentially uh, lo the local, right, against the, the global if you want to. Yeah, maybe I could say something. Um, so from my perspective, it's really about how it might reconfigure the way we see and encode and make form. Yeah, this well, at least for, from from my point of view, is this idea of seeing form, say, in an autoregressive way, as if every discrete, as if every form could be decomposed into almost like pixels, where you could learn the joint conditionals mathematically, you know, and also the idea of uh, probabilistic generation, which has to do with this predictive aspect of design. So I think fundamentally is thinking the way in which architects or well, in my, for my case, my architecture students in SUTD, uh, trying to even understand this, what, what's going on, this idea of high dimension, this I, what is be beyond 3D for an architect. So uh, from my experience in interacting with my students in my the course I'm teaching at SUTD, Creative Machine Learning, they, they struggle quite a bit uh, in the beginning until they get their hands dirty to 
get kind of encouraged that okay, we are seeing cool stuff. Maybe it's worth pursuing. So um, yeah, it is a very new tool. So uh, very promising tool, but require much clarification and and experimentation. I like how the cool factor becomes a motivation there. <laughs> Always. Yeah, architects like cool stuff, no? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but I guess I guess there's also like a cultural project or a cultural journey that the designer has to go through in curating and selecting those images and putting them together. That may actually hint to what Jeffrey was talking about, that project of resistance or the fact that simply by just having to go through so many images and taking the care of filtering them, perhaps that already builds up a different approach to to, to, to the basically the material you're working with, uh, which I think it's a an interesting question to be asked if it uh, if it's really true uh, that students or researchers change their approach by looking at the data and curating it, as Cristobal mentioned. To it's also the right. It's also the the kind of n dimensions we were talking about. It kind of challenges the fundamentals of tectonics and moves it into a totally different spatial discourse, if you like. Um, and yeah, there is a question on that as well, like from Nidin as well, which basically is asking the, the speakers if AI and GAN involvement in smart building, or like how do, how do the speakers see the AI and GAN's involvement in smart building? For instance, uh, can data from BIS uh, can be used to design better architecture? Or maybe I would adjust the question, say what <laughs> can data from building information system can be used to design what type of architecture? <laughs> the better aspect is there. Yeah, it's all a question of, uh, it's, a, it, it's how you define better architecture, of course, right? And uh, typically um, AI has been used to optimize uh, um, along certain dimensions. And if that's better architecture, that's definitely uh, being done everywhere, or better usage of uh, space, better energy savings, better and so forth, right? The, what we were interested in, I think, with the GAN was better architecture in a very different way, right? So it's um, it's more meaningful architecture, more on a semiotic level. But, uh, and then you could, you may be able to use beam data to analyze certain geometries and certain, that you could not do with, uh, I think you could, um, complement um, uh, image-based um, uh, techniques with uh, more vec vectoral and uh, spatial, uh, you know, uh, geometrical based to, to find more interesting forms and so forth. Cristobal, are you, are you along the lines of starting to do that? Like trying to upload or connect models which is not so much image based, but perhaps performance based, and where you introduce other dimensions which are not just GANs from images or text, but I don't know, building parameters, or is it somehow there in the industry, or is it still like, wow, science fiction? No, I think it's definitely not science fiction. It seems definitely possible. Again, I'm not a trained architect. I, I, I think I, I I understand what BIM works and how it, it, it actually works in, in the design kind of like um, uh, workflow. Um, but if it's just raw data, if it's the definitions of how a building should be uh, kind of like um, designed and you have those parameters and those parameters are just data, the way they're dating like a grasshopper uh, kind of like script, then you can use that to train uh, and optimize. I guess the question uh, was posed before is like, what what is better architecture? I'm not sure. I I guess you guys should tell me like what's what's better architecture. Uh, but from a technical perspective, it's definitely possible to play with those. What what I think it's interesting is also combining it with different um, with different systems. So being able to Trade traditional like uh, data driven designs approaches and then combining them with non traditional data designer driven approaches in a system that understands both. Um, and this is something I know Autodesk has a building, I know um, Adobe has a building in like and software that probably you all already use. 
Um, and so I wouldn't see it as science fiction. I would just see it as like, it, it's eventually going to become more and more current. I think overall, we're fascinated by the idea of like having ML systems embedded and being very conscious about we're using them in our software. Eventually, we'll fade away and we're, never, we're not going to start questioning if we use ML in our day-to-day -day life the same way that when we take a picture with our phones, you're running like 20 different neural networks and you're never you're never like asking yourself, oh, I'm collaborating with an AI because I, I took a picture. Just like it works, it's optimized for you. You stop thinking about it and like the image works really well. Um, and so the same thing, I think it's starting to happen more and more in software, in the design field, in architect field, that it's just gonna become like a, a, like a thing that you always use um, and it's there for you to use it or not. Um, and it's a kind of like a commodity of sorts. I think on that topic of the of the models, if I remember correct, that Runway also integrates, or you can daisy chain models, or you can like basically pass the information from one to another one, and so on. Yeah, right. But I think that's an interesting as well take on it, as you can you can start building up almost a, let's say, an AI design pipeline, if you want to call it that way, and you start from a narrative and you run it through again, and you can, yeah, semantically. Uh, Right. Content. right, and that's 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 um, that's challenging because the models work in different in, different inputs of sorts. Mm -hmm. So you need to be able to compatibilize, like make sure they can work together. Mm -hmm. But in like in in raw research in in, the, in deep learning and ML, um, you you use that a lot. You start chaining models. You use an architecture like a ResNet or a UNet architecture. You you pair with a uh, with a VI or a GAN, and uh, you start composing models together. And so if research is already being done like that, I think in the design approach, in you know, like a higher aspect, people should also be able to connect those to figure out ways or techniques or procedures that actually work for what they're looking for. Um, so I think there's a lot still of research to be done in that space specifically. I also think it's quite interesting what part of the work that we've seen at the beginning with Emmanuel, where, where AI was used to actually challenge or question a particular typology with few data or with a little amount of data. So we had the Mies van der Rohe pavilion broken down and sort of like a train through the auto or used to train an autoregressive model, but it wasn't a matter of introducing thousands of pavilions <laughs> in other words. And there's not millions of images. It was just ML being used to play around something and to enjoy and to sort of like, yeah, be playful with one object. And, and, and that, that part, that's also part of, 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 of a certain sense of exploration that AI can bring to us, not necessarily the fact that the model or the pavilion will be better than the one of Mies, but, uh, or the, the stairs of, of Bofil, but that we are using AI with little data, not with massive data. And, and I'm wondering perhaps there's also another strand of, of AI where, where we're not always about getting a ridiculous amount of training data sets, but, but just basically trying to make the most with what you already have. Um, and that may be also another trend no, of, of, of the usage. I think it's quite interesting as well. well the, the way I see um, in the context of design, the problem is, as you said, it's, it's just ridiculous to, to design one thing with, by getting a million of them first. Right, this scalability is a major issue. The other issue is in the design context, unlike say art, might be wrong, but where there are indeed design constraints, and I think the conditional models are very promising, where it provides that opportunity to input constraints, something that I've been doing with my students, and it, it, it encourages kind of. Uh, I suppose more um, critical, or making critical decision or, or deliberate decision at least, rather than just letting, you know, rather than just controlling at the data set curation level, which is, could only do that much, I would say. <laughs> yeah. And there, there are, there is a trend anyway, that uh, increasingly in research, even in the CS world, there is idea of single image, Again, or that sort of thing, they are coming in. So this is a scalability problem that has to be resolved eventually in the design context.
I see a, a question on the on the chat uh, from Dan Alvarez. How can we involve the architects in the creative process as an active subject beyond the curator that simply chooses data sets or a passive analyzer of what the machine is able to generate? How to address the political aspect of this new human machine creative symbiosis? I think it's a very good question, uh, Diana, but I'm, I'm, this is why I started with this, uh, this, this example of uh, Mamo Sani, the, the African uh, electronic mu uh, musician who, who deliberately um, uses his music to, uh, to, to, to make the, you know, the folkloric uh, aspect of, the, of, of, of his time, of his, of his region, known and resist and uh, be resilient to, essentially to act of resistance, right? To, 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 to sample those, those sounds against the, the, of course, prevalent imp, uh, import of uh, other, other music. So to me, the, the, as an active, you, you say, I think the, cu the curator is not a passive uh, act, it's a very active political act. Um, how do you curate? It's, it, it changes the whole tone, right, of uh, what, you, what you're doing. And the, so, so, so I would say that um, there is always a political dimension, right, in, in, um, in, in this. I would say just to add to that, I think I think curating a data set it's an active and political act, act of sorts. Like it's it's the idea of biases of how you how models perform or a specific data set really is informed by the data sets that we use. And we see those being very explicit in like algorithms that are governed or are used inside um, um, camera like or video or image detection like systems, right? Or security systems or search, right? And, and we see a political nature of it because the data set used was not wide open, was not um, uh, diverse enough, really, let's say. And so you can extrapolate the same in the design process. And so the, the selection of the data sets really informs the biases that you're gonna get at the end. And so the act of selecting which data set, it's basically the, the active subject for me. Um, that's a huge aspect of the whole ML process in, in general. So I'm kind of like thinking from that perspective. I actually think think that the from my experience, my student usually they have problem with the computing access, right? So that is actually a shift where, well, unless everyone use runway for instance and is not too expensive, then then there isn't really a political issue. But eventually, if we hit that point where architects start to use the black box and they don't have the computing uh, access then they are you know they, they, it, it, i don't think it's healthy that we we become consumers in in a way and although i absolutely agree that curation of the data set is is something that is not passive but there is this bottleneck where we can't go in there and and change some stuff yeah so that eventually would, would create a problem in terms of critical, critical thinking and because of this power shift. But for instance, in, in SUTD, we, what in, in the very favorable context of Singapore, being a, in the faculty is that you, you, if you have a project, it allows you to have access to the national supercomputing clusters. That helps tremendously, but this is not, typical of what a student could have access to. But I guess, I guess it's not when a designer designs, say a brutalist building, perhaps this designer has in haste or her mind, lots of books that were sort of like studied in the past, the same way that the machine was learning in Cristobal's example to create these brutalist buildings, but those books were created by somebody anyway. So 
when you book the book, when you bought the book from Taschen, somebody already selected which brutalist buildings you should be seeing. Uh, so perhaps you you didn't you don't know it, but you were already being sort of like geared towards particular uh, elements in in literature. Uh, in the same way that when you open Cristobal's brutalist <laughs> catalog, you are already geared towards whoever did the design did. But but the same thing happens when you buy a book from Tascher, I guess somebody already <laughs> took the decision for you. Uh, so it's actually whether at some point in time, somebody entering runway ML will be able to see those data sets or sort of like navigate through them or try to understand what were the biases of, of whoever selected those data sets, which is gonna be quite important, I guess. Yeah, I completely agree. I think I think it's it's also a challenge to like we need to understand that in general the field is very I mean it's it has a long history of research, right? From the 40s and 50s. But there's been times where like the research has been stuck. Um, and where we're now kind of like experiencing a um uh like a blooming right of sorts, investment research and, and competing resources are very available and have dramatically changed the the field and specifically these kind of questions are being posed because of that. Uh, but we're still very early on on the field itself, and it's I feel it's like similar to having like conversations about user interfaces and computers in the 70s, and like people trying to understand how you will use a computer for your day to day work and what are the politics and interactions and the systems around it. Where there are a lot of things to be honest that we'll still need to figure out as designers and a society in general that it just will come up from more people using the systems uh, in the day to day life, like telling in the 60s or 70s that you'll be using a computer to create CGI and to create like photorealistic like movies and editing. It's like unthinkable of like we only came to that point because computers started to get like easier, cheaper, faster. You were able to put it in your house and it didn't have to like become like a huge device the size of a fridge, right? And so a lot of questions are still unanswered and we'll just need time to figure those things out. We need to adjust the society of like how to use the systems in a way that will help us and benefit all. And I think we're, it's, it's hard to see it now because we're in the midst of it, but we're, I think we're like very, very, very early on. We're like with those terminals in the 60s and 70s, we just saw like a green thing and, and your computer were basically in that same space in, in ML, I would say. Um, and, and things will, with the only variation that uh, uh, I think things are growing and advancing way more exponentially than they, they use in the uh, previous competing era. So I to maybe add on, on that, but I think we need to, to realize that when we talk about inputs and models here, it's not just you know image synthesis models. We talk about motion capture, right? Like PoseNet and right, dense pose from Facebook. We talk about object recognition. We talk about semantic analysis is like your palette even as a curator is not limited to form and visual but is limited to context and i think that opens up a, a, such a different context basically yeah cool um i'm not sure there are any other questions i think it uh, already 2.30. Yeah, so we're good on time. We're, if there are no questions, we can uh, we can call it a day. So uh, I'm, I, I have to admit, we're, we're extremely on time on this round. Like everything is like by the clock. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Super high precision here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, cool. So thanks everybody for, for coming. Yeah. Thanks to Manuel, Jeffrey and Cristobal for the interventions, super interesting. Um, and yeah, just to ask everybody if they can also come next Monday to uh, another talk, in this case, about the nature of, of creativity and represent, representation and intuition by Sean Hanna uh, on uh, roughly the same time, obviously, 1 uh, p.m. Uh, next Monday. So yeah, without further ado, uh, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, so you can... Now clap and unmute. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Claps. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks.
Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye.